Guten Abend, Berlin. Heute Abend, wir sollen über Grafendatenbanken sprechen. Knoten, Kanten, links, rechts, geradeaus, Currywurst, that's it. I'm out. <laughs> That's it. I don't know anything else. That's as much German you're going to get out of me uh, tonight. And I learned 90% of it tonight while we were trying to find something to eat while walking here. Left, right, curry, hot dog, or something like that. Cool. Fantastic to be here. Uh, Berlin has for a long time been one of my favorite cities uh, in, in Europe. Um, and. Uh, I haven't been here as much recently, and I love the booming startup community that you hear so much about. Uh, so great to be here. My name again is Emil Afram, and I work on a product called Neo4j. And if you haven't heard of it uh, before today, you will, because I'm going to be talking about it for about, well, for exactly an hour, apparently. Um, I want to add to what he said in that if you want to tweet about this or give feedback, please do that. Uh, let me know if I'm doing good or bad. Uh, to the GD, was it GD Tech Talk? GD Tech Talk hashtag. Please also add the Neo4j hashtag because I monitor that one religiously. But it's a small crew. Let's just keep it interactive. Just interrupt me if there's if there's anything. Cool. Um, we have a super simple agenda for today. Uh, I'm going to start with zooming out a little bit and just talk about the graph database space in general. Uh, I assume that. Most of you aren't graph database experts. So I'm going to talk a little bit about snapshot of where, where the industry is today. Um, and then we're going to actually take a little bit more foundational and fundamental step and talk about what is a graph database. I figured, fail on me if you, we, you leave this session and you don't know what a graph database is. Um, and then we're going to conclude with some real world use cases. Uh, so we're going to talk about the industry and then the theory, but then how it's actually being used by, by real world people out there today. So that's, that's it. Before that, though, prior to this talk, how many here had heard of Neo4j? Hands up. 80%. Uh, how many have used Neo4j at least once? 30%, maybe, something like that. Uh, how many have used it in production, have built an app and have it in production? One, two, something like that. All right, cool. Awesome. So, a word of warning before we take it further. Graphs are very contagious. They're amazingly beautiful. <laughs> and some other people who have seen this talk have actually gone away and they've caught the disease. So, I can't promise you that won't happen to you. All I'm offering is the truth. Um, here are some examples. A gentleman who started working with Neo4j, and then after a while he looked at his photos. Can you, can you see that? Can you see the photos? And basically of, of fireworks, and he looked at that, and it's like, it's graphs. And a fellow countryman of yours uh, worked with Neo4j, and then looked at his curtains, and said, damn it, Neo4j, I'm seeing graphs everywhere, even in the curtains, right? That may well very well happen to you after this talk, but we'll see. Cool. So before we go further, actually, let's start interactive. Um, I have six logos up here on the slide. Can someone tell me what do these companies have in common? Just shout it out. Sh shout. <laughs> Neo4j, OK. Uh, unfortunately, not. Some of them do, but not all of them. Yeah, evil. <laughs> Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> subjective, subjective. I'm being recorded, so subjective. Wait, they're being recorded, so no. <laughs> Potential customers, ergo, not evil. Social, cool. Anything else? Lots of data. All good, maybe for the evil part. I'm not sure about that, but all the other were good. I gave a talk, a similar talk, actually a different talk, but I also showed this slide at... Uh, to an audience um, actually earlier today, and one, one guy yelled out, uh, their logo has the color blue in it. <laughs> <laughs> That's not great. That's ama amazing pattern matching. I'm like, dude, I want to hire you for something. 
<laughs> I thought it was great. So, I mean, I'm the graph guy, right? So obviously this has something to do with the graphs. It turns out that all six of these companies are market winners. They've won their market. And the key reason, the key thing, if you peel away everything on what they do versus the competition, is that they said that, look, I have a bunch of data. Someone said lots of data. But I'm not just going to look at that data as isolated elements, but I'm going to look and see that there's actually a connection in that data. And I'm going to use those connections to glean new insights, improve my product with those insights, and thereby win the market. All of these six companies, that is the secret sauce to why they won. And this is following a trend that we call graphs are eating the world, which is modeled after Mark Andreessen's software is eating the world. How many here have heard of the term, the phrase, software is eating the world? Hands up. So a few. So basically, Mark Andreessen is the co-founder of, of Netscape um, and a bunch of other companies and one of the most successful angel investors and one of the most successful venture capitalists in the world. And he basically controls our entire industry, <laughs> basically. Um, and one of the things that he coined a, a while ago was this, this notion of software is eating the world. And the point was that software used to be a specific vertical, a specific industry, um, but now software is spreading into every industry, right? And people are using software to dominate this industry. Hotels, very non-software business except that Airbnb is kind of completely dominating that, taking a, a new software approach to hotels and thereby completely winning the market. So that's the software is eating the world. And we're seeing exactly the same thing with graphs. Graphs are eating the world. A couple of examples of that. The most stark one that I like to, 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 to talk about because it's so, um, uh, it's so obvious, at least in retrospect, is web search, right? So way back in the days when dinosaurs ruled the earth, uh, i.e. The, the end of the 90s, right? Uh, there were a bunch of search engines around, like 50 of them, right? And some of you will remember them. They were the Excites and the Lycus and the Alta Vista and the Hotbot. I'm sure there was some local German. Wh what's a local German one? Wh Fireball. Oh, really? I, I never used that. Yeah, don't. Okay, yeah. Fire something, fire something, foyer, foyer something. Yeah, uh huh. That's right. Yeah, there's more in here than you think. Um, so there was a bunch of them, and I remember looking at them back in the 90s and just being blown away at the technology. Basically, there's this new phenomena called the web out there, where like data sizes are growing at a rate humanity has never ever seen before, never ever, right? So what we're going to do, we being Excite or AltaVista or whatever, like what we're going to do is that we're going to download each and every one of these pages, like all of them. What do you mean all of them? Like all of them, right? Into our data center. And then if you search for Berlin, right, we're going to look inside of every one of these documents. And with all the documents that we find Berlin, we're going to serve that back to the user. And it's going to be indexes, of course, for that. But conceptually, look inside of each and every one of these documents. Um, and oh, by the way, this thing with where we downloaded the entire web, we're going to do that once per day, right? For how long? Surely just for a week or so. No, 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 in perpetuity. I, I just thought that was amazing technology and an amazing approach uh, back then. And that's cool, and there were 50 of them, but then along came a small startup. And we all know which startup that was, right? Which said, I'm going to do exactly the same thing as everyone else, but... I'm going to look inside of these documents, and I'm going to see that there's HTML in there, and there's a tag called ahref. By the way, we've now also maxed out my uh, knowledge of HTML. <laughs> this is as much I know of HTML. <laughs> but I do know that there's an ahref tag in there, and that means a link from one page to another page. And so they're going to take that, they're going to extract it, and they're going to connect it, and it's going to form a connected data stru structure. And then they use that one to rank the search results. So out of these gazillion hits that had Berlin in them, they ranked them according to this graph. And of course, the ranking algorithm is called PageRank, actually uh, by the gentleman who invented it, not after Pages, uh, but after Larry Page. And of course, that company was Google. And that was the key thing, the only thing that they did different, or at least the one, the high order bit that mattered versus all the other co companies. And that's what allowed them to completely dominate the market and ultimately 
be what I believe at least is the, the most foundational and fundamental company of at least the previous decade, maybe this decade. Another example, monster.com, job search. They do what we've always done when we look for jobs, which is find a job ad, find a CV, look if they match, right? Do keyword matching, basically. If they seem to match up well, all right, cool. Let's start the interview process. That's what they do. But then came one guy who said, huh, actually, that's not true. What humanity has always done when we're looking for something to do, when we're looking for a job or an occupation, what do we do? Well, we look through our personal network. We ask our friends and ask, their ask them to ask their friends. Our graph, right? So what if I could build an app that made people volunteer those connections that exist in the real world, uh, those friendship connections, digitalize them, and then use them to, to build basically a job search, a glorified job search site. And that, of course, was LinkedIn, right? And he managed to pull it off, Reid Hoffman, and, and that's why LinkedIn is 14 gazillion times more valuable than, than monster.com. Third example, more subtle, online payments. There were a bunch of people, mostly banks, who tried to do online payments in the early 2000s. Uh, the, the key problem, the key risk to online payments is fraud. And the problem these guys had was that they only saw individual transactions. So they saw um, Emil transfers money to Pat, right? And that's it, nothing else. And it turns out that if you only have that a very isolated view uh, of, of transactions, it's hard to detect fraud. Um, and then PayPal came along, right? And what they said is, hey, we're going to get a view of the entire pay payment network or the payment graph. And that is what allowed them to do proper fraud detection, which was what m made them take off. Three examples where they've done a sort of a shift and said that we're going to use the data we already have, but we're going to look at the connections. Not just look at the connections, but use the connections. That's going to allow us to build better products. These were all consumer web examples. But what we argue at Neo4j and what we see based on the data of, of usage that we see today is that this is not just a consumer web phenomenon. This is something that is eventually spreading completely horizontally to all industries. In fact, when we, you know, we're a, we're a company, Neo Technology is the company behind Neo4j, and we're VC backed, right? Investors. Uh, and when you raise money, you need to stop just talking about uh, Knoten und Kanten. And, and stuff like that, and, and start talking about the market and who's actually going to, you know, uh, is there big enough of a market to sustain a company around this? And um, we formed a hypothesis a few years ago when you raised our whatever A round that we thought that the market would be in three key verticals, software, financial services, and telecom, doing four key things. Network and data center management, mass data management, social, and geo, and we'll double click on some of these later but four key use cases. And this was based on sort of the community usage that we saw a few, few um, years ago and also some early customers. We did have a few customers back then. Um, and now we have the scorecard for this, right? So these are some of the public companies that are using Neo4j today um, in production, up and running. Um, and you can see that the matrix is filling out very rapidly. Um, we have big companies like HP and Alcatel Lucent and Cisco and Pitney Bowes, Global 2000, Fortune 500 companies, but also small companies. 53 won Apple's um, design award for the year. Last year, I think. Um, it's a small New York-based company uh, doing some really cool stuff, right? So we're very happy about that and proud and all those good things. Um, what's even been more amazing is the traction that we've seen outside of this early adopter market. And this comes back to the earlier trend. The graphs are eating the world where we see that vertical after vertical, industry after industry. If one company comes in there and say, hey, you know, I'm going to take a connection view of this, manage to build that using good technology, pull that into their product, their product will be better uh, than their competitors, and that's going to force the competitors to also adopt graphs. Right? So that's the sort of high-level zoom uh, out from a, from a business perspective. On the community side, uh, what we've seen is that out of the sort of old NoSQL cousins, remember back when NoSQL came along and people always talked about how it was uh, apples and apples, right? The, these, all these products are interchangeable. That there's one NoSQL category. And after a while, we realized that, no, maybe that's actually not true. Uh, there's actually separate subcategories of NoSQL and four in particular, I think, key value stores, right? The Reacts and whatnot of the world. Um, 
and column family, Cassandra, et cetera, and document databases uh, and graph databases, right? Um, now, there's, now that there's so many new types of, of database projects, there are actually a couple of interesting uh, sites out there that follow sort of a popularity in the database space. In part particular, there's one called DB Engines, which measures popularity of all these projects, right? And it's just popularity. It's not something with real substance. It's like the, I guess this is not an American audience, but when I, when I describe it in America, I say it's like teenage high school kind of thing, right? Uh, where in America, there it's, uh, I actually didn't go to an American high school, even though I'm Swedish. Um, and popularity is way more important <laughs> over there than anywhere else in the world. So this is a little bit of a teenage sort of American high school version, but they compute a bunch of signals, like tweets about projects and um, LinkedIn skills and Indeed.com job posts and, and things like that, and they compute a score. And they also compute uh, how much the specific categories are growing, like documents and, and relational and key value, et cetera. And graphs is clearly the smallest in terms of awareness. It's clearly the smallest out of all of these four NoSQL categories. But the interesting thing is that actually for the past two years, most, most of this time in the past two years, um, graphs have been the fastest growing category, right? So it's rapidly catching up in terms of awareness. And I think there are a number of reasons for that. Um, there's also on the, on the analyst side, I'm actually going to not talk about this one, but there's a lot of good things happening on the analyst side when it comes to traction inside of the enterprise. Um, so that sort of context, where is the graph database space as of today, right? Well, taking a step back then, like what is a graph? Uh, maybe that's good if, if, if we actually talk about that. Um, so Neo4j uses a specific type of, of graph model called the property graph model. And when you're working with a, with a property graph, uh, what you want to do is very typically you want to model something that exists in the real world, right? And I'm going to use an example here, and it, it's a very simple example. We have a girl who loves a boy. Very simple. But not just any girl. We have a girl named Anne who loves Dan, right? And this is what we want to model in, in, our, in, in our database. But before we go into the database, right, let's say that we had a whiteboard here. If I wanted to describe this using a whiteboard for you, I may draw something like this, right? Anne loves Dan, right? I'm lazy and I'm a really, really bad, like, artist, so I, I can't draw Anne, right? So I'm going to use a circle, right? In the graph world, we call these knoten, okay, no, we don't do that. We call them nodes and relationships, right? So very simple, nodes and relationships. Now, that's on a whiteboard. A whiteboard is amazing because it's a two-dimensional structure. What if you wanted to communicate the same thing using just a keyboard? Right? Say you're chatting with someone uh, using Slack or Instagram or Snapchat or whatever. Like something textual, right? And you want to describe the same thing. You can imagine that you use something like this. Right? And here it's sort of a circle, right? You want to draw a circle, you draw, put it in parentheses, and then you want to draw this arrow, so you use ASCII art. Of course, who here remembers ASCII art? That's right, we're bringing it back. <laughs> um, so you use ASCII art to draw this little arrow, and loves Dan, right? You can see the circles and, and the arrows, right? That's cool. We're already well on our way to, to be graphing. See how easy this is? Um, but we're not happy enough with just these symbols. This is basically variable names, right? Um, but we also want to add some information. And first off, Anne is not just a generic node. Generic node. She's a person, right? So we describe that using a label. In this particular case, we describe the label using colon person, right? That describes the label. Um, and then we add some actual data, some attributes to there. And the attributes are JSON-ish, right? So it's like whatever, curly bracket, and then name colon n, and we can comma age colon 34, et cetera, right? Pretty simple, and we do the same thing, of course, with the, with the Dan node over there. Cool. Makes sense so far? Yes? No? Question? No. Makes sense. Awesome. Love it. Thank you. Um, so super simple. We have nodes, relationship, nodes. Very simple pattern, comes back all the time, node, relationship, node. If you, ca if you can do that, 
you can graph. So what if we want to query then, right? Uh, we want to uh, not just prescribe that Anne loves Dan, but we actually want to query and say, whom does Anne love, right? Then we use basically the same pattern here, but rather than saying specifically Dan, we insert a whom, right? Just a variable substitution. And then there's a query language called Cypher, Cypher which is the way that you interact with Neo4j. Um, and there's a keyword in there called match, Okay, Cypher is a pattern matching query language. So the foundational element is patterns. And the patterns are described using this ASCII art type syntax. And it turns out that many, not, not all, but many operations that you want to do on a graph database boils down to describing small patterns or sometimes large patterns and throw that to Neo4j and it's going to crawl its entire big graph and find instances of those patterns and return them back out, right? And here's how we would do that. You say match this thing, and when you've found it, return specifically whom, right? And whom could be whom.name, right? In this particular case, we're going to return the actual node. It could be whom.name or something like that, right? Pretty obvious, I think, right? So let's take a real world, real worlder example than this, right? So let's say that um, we're I'm going to New York, um, and uh, I want to find a restaurant in New York. I want to do sort of a Yelpy type thing, um, except that I want to use my social graph, right? So then I say, give me all the restaurants in New York that my friends like, right? If you look at this, this query, and if we look at the actual graph it would work on, it's something like this, right? Here we have me, and we have my two friends. And I want for the record, since this is being recorded, this is a fake example. In reality, I have many friends. I'm very popular. <laughs> Want the record to show that? So my fake two friends out of thousands and thousands, um, what do they like? Well, they like this place called I Heart Sushi and this place called Zuji Zam. <laughs> um, and they're located in New York and they serve sushi, right? So this is basically the type of graph that we would describe and send to the graph database, right? So we have sushi restaurant in New York, New York that my friends like. We're gonna start with me. We're gonna go to my friends. We're gonna go to things they like and look at are they restaurants? Do they serve sushi? Are they in New York, right? And in Cypher, now that we've learned sort of the syntax and, and the syntax in, in Cypher is actually pretty, pretty heavy, right? Until you learn to zoom out and look at it using this ASCII art, right? But here we have me, friend of friend, Friend likes a restaurant, the restaurant is in New York, and it serves sushi, right? And then we bind a few of the variables to various parts of the graph, right? Pretty simple. There's uh, an amazing blog post by a gentleman called MaxDemarcy.com. No, he's not called MaxDemarcy.com. His name is Max Demarcy, and his website is on MaxDemarcy.com, where he basically, when, when Facebook launched a graph search in, uh, I believe, January of 13, early, early last year, he, the next weekend after they launched it, it re he re-implemented it using some off-the-shelf NLP, uh, natural language uh, parsing libraries on Ruby, um, and then Neo4j. And you could like, basically do all the queries that Zuckerberg showed on stage. You can run on top of that with your own social graph. You pulled in data from, your, from, from Facebook uh, if you entered your username, and then you could just implement that. And it was a few hundred lines of code uh, using some libraries and, and Neo4j. So go to maxdemarcy.com and search for Facebook if you're interested in that kind of stuff. So that's cool. Um, let's take a step out of the social domain. Uh, so HR is actually an area that is rapidly seeing a lot of traction in graph databases. So if you work at a big company, uh, it's they're obviously going to have a huge record of everyone that works at the, at the company. And since most companies today are organized hierarchically, even though they should be graphs, even though in reality they are graphs, uh, most HR systems don't see that yet. However, a hierarchy is a tree. A tree is just a reduced graph, right? So you can very easily model a, an, an organizational hierarchy using uh, a graph database. Now, if we don't do that, uh, and we want to answer a query like this one, uh, find all the direct reports of a person, grab the VP of sales, uh, give all of his direct uh, uh, hierarchy three down, all the people that report to him, and tell me how many report that report to them, right? Pretty simple query. 
Um, in SQL, it looks like this. There's an actual query implemented by a partner of ours for, for a customer. I'll look at that animation again. Uh, that's good stuff. And it's actually a lie, because so, actually in reality what these guys wanted to do is that they wanted to do it eight levels down, um, but they weren't able to produce code that the SQL parser would accept for this. They weren't able to write code that even terminated like using this. So what they ended up doing is that they wrote a program that generated the code, which so then finally it ran, except it never terminated because it was too slow. <laughs> right. And in Cypher, this one is super easy, right? Which is amazing and super happy. Imagine that all that fiery code versus this, right? And if you want to change it from three to eight, you change the three to an eight, <laughs> right? And you're done. Um, but it's also pretty obvious, right? This is what we're supposed to do, right? And in particular, arbitrary path length queries, what we talked about before, when you don't know ahead of time how many hops away something is going to be, is that SQL as a language, setting aside the relational model, because we can actually argue whether the relational algebra is good or bad at that, but SQL as a language is horrible at that. I like to call it the, the sweet spot of suck for SQL. The sweet spot of suck. Arbitrary path length queries. And in Neo4j, that's like adding an asterisk, right? Well, in, in Cypher. So that's cool. That's from a sort of compiler, what I like to call compile time development experience perspective, right? But if we look at I into sort of a runtime perspective, there's this uh, example that we've used for quite a while, uh, where we talk about sort of the how stark the performance differences can be uh, when you have a graph database versus a relational database. And it takes its root in, in actually uh, a customer request that we got from a prospect that said, hey, we're a huge social network and we love graph databases, but we really want to see your performance. And us being the honest Swedish geeks that we are, we said that, look, we, we try to really, really hard to avoid benchmarks. And um, my, my personal theory on benchmarks uh, is that there's lies, damn lies, statistics, and then benchmarks, right? <laughs> you can prove anything you want with the benchmark. Someone should write a blog post about that. Um, so anyways. Um, but, so we said, how about you give us a scenario that is relevant for you, um, and uh, we'll show you our numbers. And the scenario they gave us was that, imagine that you have a social network with 1,000 people, 50 friends on average, right? So 25,000 connections in the graph. Grab two people, uh, grab me and Patrick, see if we're connected, right? And we implemented that using the other Swedish open source database out there, right, MySQL. Um, and it's a 2,000 millisecond operation. And this is substantial enough, as I think we all understand in this room, uh, that you can't use it at runtime, right? If, you, if you're Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter or something like that, when you render the news feed, you need to do a bunch of these, right? And 2,000 millisecond is obviously too, too slow, right? And in Neo4j, it's a two millisecond operation. So we're super happy and, and amazed about that. Um, but we upped the ante a little bit, added a million people grab two people at random, and the punchline, of course, is that it's still two millisecond uh, for us. This is a very contrived example in the sense that this is exactly what we're good at, right? And you can, you can I imagine equivalent examples for a relational database where we have exactly the opposite numbers, right? Uh, but that's sort of the point, right? Like the whole, the whole narrative around NoSQL is choose the tool that is right for the job at hand, right? And if you have a, a data set with a specific shape, and queries along that shape. If you can find a data model that maps with that, you can get these kinds of performance benefits. Um, and every situation is unique. Only two VCs do I promise that we're a thousand times faster. <laughs> In front of a tech audience, I wouldn't do that. But two VCs, I do that. Um, uh, so every si situation is unique. Uh, but these are the types of performance improvements that you can get if you use a tool appropriate for the, for the situation at hand. So the slideware, uh, I'm going to back that up with more slideware. <laughs> and, but this is actually an, a, a real-world example from a, a, um, an actual real-world user and a fellow countryman of yours, in a guy called Volker Pacher, Pacher um, who is uh, the lead developer of eBay Now. eBay Now. Have you guys used eBay Now? 
I don't know, maybe it doesn't exist in Berlin yet? No, it, it, does it exist in Berlin? Okay. Yeah, I don't know, because they're rolling it out in, in a few, I mean, it's a city-based thing. So basically it's, it's eBay's response to the amazingly cool Amazon drones, right? <laughs> You've seen the, the, the fe news feature on that, right? The drones that pick up your stuff and then drop it off at your, I love living in the future. Um, but, but this is basically their response to that. Um, and, um, but it, it's out and up and running and works now. So basically it's the same day delivery thing. You order on eBay 30 minutes later, uh, or at least the same day you have it in your hand. And uh, Volker was at our conference, Graph Connect, uh, last week or two weeks ago, I guess. Last week in some time zone, I don't know, I'm confused. At some point, in some time you need to go. He was there and he did a fantastic talk where he started by going online on eBay and he ordered a bottle of whiskey. And then he gave a talk for 30 minutes and at the end of the talk, someone walked up with that bottle of whiskey being same day, I mean, say within the 30 minutes delivered to him, right? It's like a super cool thing. Um, so I thought that was uh, very cool. So on that note, where's my bottle of whiskey? <laughs> no, no? Okay. <laughs> Um, and, and they were in a situation where they were on MySQL and they had uh, a response time in their database that uh, their slowest query was slower than their fastest physical delivery. <laughs> so they had some MySQL queries that were 45 minutes and some actual deliveries that were 30 minutes, right? <laughs> Pretty amazing. Cool, so that's Graph one on one, one oh one, sort of the, the fundamentals. And now let's talk a little bit about use cases. So where are graphs being used? Right? I mean I think if you ask average geek out there, they're gonna say that yeah, graphs are really awesome for super specialized niche of use cases involving social. That I think if you if you ask random people, that's that's what they would say. Ma or I hope they would say graphs da graph databases are awesome. Maybe they wouldn't even say that. Um but we actually see now at Neo4j, when we, we have a, uh, a pretty good view of a lot of the activity in, in the graph database space, uh, social use cases are by far the minority. By far the minority. They're the most obvious one, maybe. And Zuckerberg has conditioned us to think social graph, right? We now know that graph doesn't just mean charts in Excel, right? It also means something else. Knoten and Kanten. And social graph, graph database, that kind of makes sense, right? Um, but there's a bunch of other use cases out there, and I'm going to walk you through some of them. The first one is network and impact analysis. And I'm actually going to give you uh, an example of, of this live, because live coding always works. Um, imagine that we have a data center. Imagine that it's 100,000 physical machines or something like that, a big data center. Um, and uh, you know, every machine runs 10 virtual machines, right? So we have even more virtual machines. Um, and we want to try to make sense of it. We want to know what happens if that firewall over there, what if that one goes down? What's going to happen? Or wait, 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 all these 14, you know, on my ops dashboard, all these 14 machines are flashing red. Is that because all 14 of them have simultaneously died? Or is it because that switch went down, which, it's which, which, which they're connected to? Things like that. Um, that's very intuitive. If you have a smaller one, you can just look at it, right? But if you have hundreds of thousands, it becomes very unwieldy very quickly. Um, so let's see here. So I'm now running a uh, local Neo4j instance. Uh, when you uh, start up Neo4j, the first thing you see is this uh, Neo4j browser is what we call it, this web user interface, which is a super simple interface. Uh, it has uh, a query bar at the top, and then it has a bunch of result panes. This, this first window here is the result pane of one query called play welcome, right? But play welcome is, is a bit of an odd one. It starts with a colon. Everything else, you can think of this as just a cipher query bar, right? So we do a query like match any node that looks like this, i.e. any node, right? And we return it, and here we get the little result set in this window over here, which says nothing, because <laughs> there's not anything in the graph right now. Um, and then you can start hacking away, and what we're gonna do, like the T 
TV chefs in God Bless America, we have a prepped demo. So, now we want to create a small little data center. Uh, in, in the back, can you see the, see the code? Can you read the code? Cool. Um, so we're cr creating a small little data center. It's like seven uh, resources or something like that. And they're nodes of a labeled with resource, right? Which has only one property name. Uh, and so we're creating a CRM resource and a database virtual machine and a public website and whatnot, a couple other things. Um, but then we also create how they depend on one another. And it's a very, very simplified example. So we only have one type of relationship. We say that the CRM depends on the database virtual machine and the database virtual machine depends on the server two and server two depends on the SAN and stuff like that, right? You can imagine that in a real world situation, we would sniff some kind of network traffic to figure this out, to be a form a picture of the topology of the network, right? But this is a simple one. So we run this. And if we match on any node, see here, oh, that's right, that's my, now I'm gonna do a very important thing here. Yay, Sweden! Um, anyways, so we have our little graph here, right, of our data center. I don't know if you can read this, but it says that the CRM depends on the database VM and the public website depends on that and blah, 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 blah. I have two physical servers. And we get a nice little view of it, right? Um, and then we can start doing fun stuff, right? So what happens, and I'll actually change this little guy. Um, what happens if server one goes down, right? If we look at this code over here, what we're matching here is server one, which we later on bind to a node that has a name called server one, right, in the word clause. Server one depends on something that we call upstream, and then we return upstream and server one, right? So what depends on server one? And there we see server one, and it's the web server VM, right? Uh, this in SQL would be actually very easy. It's not often you'll hear me say that. <laughs> but this is one of the situations where that actually would be reasonably easy. It's a couple of joins. So left here and then right there and links recht and then an inner join and stuff like that. And, and we've joined away and we, we have the, the, uh, the answer. What is kind of, which is what is much harder though, is um, we don't want to stop just there, right? We want to look at what, hap what does web server VM, what, what depends on web server VM, right? And so what are the transitive dependencies of, the, of this one? And here's the beauty. We just add an asterisk like this, and we run it, and we're going to get all the transitive dependencies, right? So server one brings down web server VM, which brings down the public website, right? And you can, of course, imagine we can go the other way around, find all the dependencies of the public website, what needs to be running in order for the website to be up and running. And you can see that it's, it's basically the entire data center except for the CRM system, right? It's basically everything, right? Very conceptually simple queries, also easy to express in, in Cypher. And fast, even at, you know, if 100,000 or a million or 10 million, it's these kind of type of queries are super fast. Um, more sophisticated one, I both to write, I think this code is less intuitive, um, but also even conceptually to explain, is this query, which basically finds the most depended upon component. This uses a concept that in graph geek theory is called centrality, uh, which is basically a concept that identifies which of the nodes are the most important ones, right? And there's a variety of different centrality um, uh, algorithms. There's degree centrality, there's eigenvector centrality, there's between a centrality, blah, 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 blah. And they all try to figure out various measures of which is the most important node. This uses one particular one called between a centrality. Um, but basically, it's though it's a very complex thing, impossible to write using SQL, um, it's a few lines of code in Cypher, right? And as absolutely zero surprise to anyone, if we have a limited budget and we can only implement fault tolerance, for example, for one of the components, we would choose the sand, 
right? Because it's the most dependent upon component. And when we have our real world example of the hundreds of thousands of physical machines, and blah, 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 all of that, then maybe we'd not limit one here. Um, we would run this same thing, but not limit one. We would limit 100 or something like that, and then implement fault tolerance for all of those. Uh, I think great example of a domain where like the data is very much uh, graphy. The queries that you can run that to get value out of them are very much along the relationships, and it's impossible to do in any other data model uh, that I know of. So network impact analysis. So that's one use case. Um, another use case is um, I was at uh, GoToCon Berlin three hours ago. Uh, which was at Cosmos Conference Center. And we want to go here, right? How do I get from point A to point B in a really smart way, right? Or, even better, once I get there, how do I find the Kurivurst at the, <laughs> the best time? We'd, we could have used the graph database at that point, actually, because there was a lot of cyclic dependencies in that one. Um, and not enough cycle detection. Um, but getting from point A to point B is a very graph-oriented problem, right? Every city in, in um, Germany is a node. All the roads, all of Das Autobahn are relationships, right? And how do you go from point A to point B? Well, it's a graph algorithm getting from point A to point B. Very graphy use case. Um, I have a bunch of users in here. eBay now would be one example of customers uh, that are using us in the, for this one. Recommendations is probably the most uh, popular graph database use case that I see today. Uh, turns out that if you're a big retailer, Walmart is using Neo4j for, for recommendations, for example. Um, you can look at, I mean, of course, all retails, uh, retailers store the transaction logs. I shouldn't say trans the, the commercial transaction logs, not the low-level IO type transaction logs, um, of uh, Emil bought this at this point and it cost X amount of dollars, you know, blah, 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 stuff like that, right? Um, and you can look at it in that way, but if you take that same data and have a graph view of it instead, you're going to get something like Emil bought uh, milk, Emil bought um, pants, Emil bought beer, right? And then we look at, we can look at who else bought those things, right? So maybe Alex then bought those three things, whatever they were. Um, and but Alex also bought a book, and not just any book. It was the Two Towers by J.R.R. Tolkien, right? And so what we can do then is implement what's called, uh, as actually a bunch of name, a collaborative filtering, uh, co collaborative filter. Uh, it's also called open triangle recommendation or triadic closure. It's a Lots of fancy words, but it's basically a very simple phenomena. Look at who else is buying the same things. Look at what they're not buying and recommend that. And if you look at that, what we're doing here, we're traversing from me one hop, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then eight hops, right? Already there in a relational database, we're gone, right? I, n I think in any model that does not uh, have efficient pointer chasing type relationship traversal, we're gone. Um, and in reality, you actually want to be a little bit more sophisticated than that. So you don't want to recommend that particular book, exactly the two towers. But in reality, the two towers is um, uh, a fantasy book. And a fantasy book is actually a fiction book, which is a book. So you have some kind of product hierarchy here, which we then have on all of these different items. And you can see how that's not eight, but it's maybe 20 or 30 or 50 hops. Neo4j, in, as a rule of thumb, with warm caches can do between one to two million hops per second in uh, a graph. Uh, so you can do quite a lot of things in, in a short amount of time. Um, so this is an example of what Walmart is using Neo4j for, but recommendations is not just for retail. We, we see that all over the place um, in, in all kinds of, of industries. Logistics, um, uh, very, big, substantial, important European country that you have heard of um, is using uh, parcel, the parcel delivery in that country is all handled by one, by one company. And that company was in big troubles a few years ago. They saw that parcel delivery, so we're not talking about the letters, the envelope, but the actual packages that you send with, you know, something with UPS or DHL or something like that, right? 
or Georgia Poetry Post or something like that. Um, highly seasonal business. By Christmas time, they have absolute peak load, and they saw that they wouldn't be able to. 2011, that Christmas would be they would be screwed basically, right? And that's not a good thing. Like if your businesses deliver parcels or packages, then you don't want you know. In Christmas time is like the the least favorite time to go down. And they saw that ahead of time because they saw the increasing, the, the predicted load. And the key problem was not that the road networks weren't able to cope with it, right? If it's, it's the equivalent of what they had was the equivalent of if you want to send something from Berlin to another city that is close to Berlin, which I don't know, what's the city that is close to Berlin? Sure, yes, to some Stadt, uh, you know, you want to send that from Berlin to some Stadt. Um, and then y th you wouldn't send it directly to the Samstadt, something or another, uh, even though there was an amazing Das Autobahn between Berlin and Samstadt, <laughs> you know, because they had to send them to core routing centers, right? They had 20 or something like that routing centers that everything had to go through in order to get delivered. Um, and so, like, so that's pretty dumb, right? So why is that happening? So they, well, it's because the software isn't telling them to go in this direction, even though that's clearly like a human being was like, yeah, just go there right now. Um, and um, so they double clicked on that. And so the key reason for that came down to the database. So the database was unable to create lateral connections in the data set. They were unable to fully represent the highly granular and very connected data structure that is a road network of any country. Um, and use that to most optimally find the path. So long story short, they threw everything out, their entire platform, which had been up and running for 20, 30 years or something like that, replaced it all with an architecture based on Neo4j. Um, and we saved Christmas that year. <laughs> um, and, and, and so basically, and also it's a very cool deployment physically because like they actually have shoots where the packages drop down and you can imagine like they scare, scan a barcode uh, at the top of the shoot, right? And that tells them where the destination is. They of course know where they are. Um, so, and then as the gravity pulls it down the shoot, a few milliseconds later, they need to decide either left or right, links or recht. This is so useful, <laughs> so useful. <laughs> either links or recht, uh, you know, at the end of, of, of the shoot. Um, in order to decide where to go, right? And in those few milliseconds, they're gonna throw that to a cluster of Neo4j instances, which is gonna calculate the optimal route, right? It's very cool. Uh, at peak, they do hundreds of thousands of these packages per minute. So great example of logistics, lots of lots of graphy data. Um, access control. Access control was actually the original use case for why we ended up building Neo4j. Neo4j, that's a completely different talk all of it of its own, actually, but uh, we have a have a long history. Uh, we we got started in in 2000 is when we started building it, and the the founders were then working on a basically content management system or a media asset management system, where we had a fucked up dom domain model, <laughs> basically, <laughs> where uh, we had a lot of assets and we need to do security and or access control on every one of them, and we had a lot of users, but not just in a flat sort of list of users. No, we had users that belonged to groups. But that wasn't enough because the groups also belonged to groups and to multiple groups potentially, right? And this thing over here was never, so once user X clicked on asset A, it was never as easy as look is look if X is in A's ACL, access control list, right? But in reality, it was all always something like, no, one of the multiple groups, the combinatorial explosion of groups that X is in, has access to either A directly, or one of the folders, or symbolic links into this thing that leads fr uh, from the root of the file system to A. Oh, you can like, see how that's like, that's really, really hairy to do in, in a relational database, right? Um, and we, uh, I, I was the CTO at the time, and I wasn't I wasn't good enough to stand up to the to my crazy CEO who forced this domain model on us. So in pure desperation, we invented graph databases, <laughs> basically, because there's no no other way of solving this problem, right? So we said that all right, that's awesome, but now like with this huge connected data set, how can we traverse that in a persistent, performant way, right? And that's how we ended up building Neo4j. And this one is coming back now. We in particular see it with banks. So 
they're one of the biggest investment banks on the planet and they're super secretive, right, the investment banks. Uh, unfortunately, we can't talk publicly about them. Um, but one of the biggest investment bank banks, they are using Neo4j for onboarding. Um, and not just onboarding of new traders, but actually everyday usage. So every day, every time someone at that investment bank is uh, uh, accessing some kind of asset, and by asset I mean not financial asset, but a document or an, uh, something like that, some collateral, uh, then they do exactly the type of lookup that I talked about. So it's being used, you know, m probably millions of times per day. Uh, so access control, very popular one, in particular in finance, but. Uh, it, we also see it outside of, of the financial domain. Fraud detection is one of those kind of boring, b boring use cases uh, in the sense that uh, it's very, very, uh, um, it's very important um, and it's very graphy, but no one, no one ever talks about how they do fraud detection, right? So we actually have several of, uh, we have a lot of usage here, but we can't talk about anything. So let me describe this one super generically and, and high level, and I still think that y you'll be able to see uh, sort of how you can use it in, in case you guys have t f uh, a domain where fraud is, is, is or may be a problem. But basically, if you really simplify it down to uh, probably oversimplify it, you can say that all fraud detection, or at least the majority of fraud detection algorithms work basically like this. You're gonna map two or more dimensions for example, transaction count and total dollar amount. And you're gonna look at all your of your transactions along this little diagram, and you're gonna see that there's a band in here, the normal band, here's where most transactions are. And then you see outliers, and you say, uh, let's investigate this one, right? So I'm now, I now live in America, so I have like 12 credit cards, and since they all buy American banks now, uh, now that I go to Sweden and or to Europe, they basically shut them down, <laughs> right? Because it's an anomaly, so they shut them down. And so I have like 12 of them, and yesterday, my the 11th one got <laughs> shut down, <laughs> and I'm going back the day after tomorrow, so I have one more transaction that I can do. <laughs> so I'd really appreciate if you guys could buy me a beer later, that'd be great. <laughs> so one more transaction, it's basically because they're detecting that I'm an anomaly here. And then, of course, I keep going back to Europe at least once per quarter, so you know they're not very, smart about it, <laughs> but at least that's what's, what's going on here. What you will miss with this though, is if you have a number of smaller operations that are all individually within this band of normality, um, but that may be fraudulent in combination, right? So for example, a fraud ring is very, very difficult, if, if possible at all, to detect using this uh, correlation analysis. Obviously, with a graph database, it's very easy to detect patterns like this. So basically, <laughs> in summary, graph all the things, all of them. Uh, not, not quite, but um, there's a quite interesting uh, blog post and research article posted by, by Gartner, and I'm sure you know Gartner and trust them as all you know, hands-on technology people do. Um, but this one was actually very good. Uh, they wrote uh, a, a post that they called uh, the four giants and the five graphs of the consumer web. Now, I kind of get sort of butterflies in my stomach whenever someone else says something about graphs, so maybe that's why I thought it was, it was great. Um, but it was also pretty interesting from a content and substance perspective. So basically what they said is that if you want to analyze the public web, and try to figure out what's going on. And we're talking about the, you know, the Facebooks and the Ebays maybe, and the Yahoos and the Apples and the Microsofts of the world, right? Um, if you want to understand what they're doing and what's driving them, it's actually all a big battle, of course, <laughs> uh, over five key resources, five key resources. And you can understand all of their actions through this. And the five key resources that they talked about was the social graph, the interest graph, the intent graph, the mobile graph, and the payment graph. All what they're doing is that they're fighting over these key resources, and they're all graphs. Obviously, the social graph is, is owned by Facebook. Equally obvious, the interest graph, sorry, the intent graph is owned by Google. Uh, interest graph, I'd say that Yahoo and Twitter are fighting over it. Um, the mobile graph, obviously Apple and Google are fighting over it. 
in the payment graph is now with the newly formed PayPal Inc. It used to be with eBay. But also, uh, Apple is building up a bil big payment graph as well. Anyways, so we thought that was a really interesting and novel way of looking at understanding a vertical. And we said that, all right, so they've done it for the public web. They've done it for the consumer web. Um, we see a lot of other graph use cases in other industries. And we're going to sort of take that as our mission to start finding the five graphs of other verticals. Right? So for example, in telco, I'm not going to go through these in details, but it turns out when you double click on telco use of, of, of graph databases, which there's quite, quite a few by now, um, there's five key graphs that these guys are, are working on. And they derive a number of use cases off of these graphs. So the network graph is the graph. It's the equivalent of the data center that, that I used before uh, as an example. Uh, but instead of, I guess, servers, it's going to be cell towers and stuff like that, right? You have the call graph, which is maybe, in a way, an inferred social graph through the calls that you make. And you can do churn reduction and stuff like that on, on that one. The help desk graph, which is the, the graph around all of the help desk tickets and the knowledge base that that generates. Um, so five graphs of telco, and we have the equivalent ones of finance, the five graphs of finance, and the five graphs of healthcare, and the five graphs of your industry. And I don't know what, what, what what's the prominent industry in, in Berlin, right? Berlin to me is three world-class symphony orchestras, three world-class opera houses. I mean, that's amazing. It's Museum Insel, and you know it's uh, startup hipsters. <laughs> so this is maybe the five graphs of you know die deutsche startup hipster or something. I don't know, but if if you if you're active in industry, uh, we're we're good. We're pretty good at graphs at at Neo4j. We've done that uh, a, a few times by now, um, but we're definitely not experts in all domains. Uh, but do if you are expert in a domain that I haven't mentioned here, and you uh, have some clue about what type of data that is very uh, uh, prevalent in your in, in in that in that vertical. I would love to talk to you, and and figure out what the five graphs of that particular vertical is. It ends up being a very good way of uh, communicating, especially to to business people, communicating to them the opportunities that graph data give them. And now we're at. 2020, and since I'm in Germany, I'm gonna <laughs> stick to the exact, you know, one one hour time. I was just complete random. I'm never on time, <laughs> but I actually managed to be on time this one time. Um, thank you very much for listening. I should have mentioned that Neo4j is open source, uh, so you can go to neo4j.com and just download it and get up and running today. Um, it's pretty easy. Uh, so get going. Start graph away your data. Um, and uh, take it from there. I'm more than happy to take questions now. You haven't been too good about interrupting me, so I hope that you piled up a bunch of questions. Are we going to do Q&A now? Or cool, awesome. Thanks for listening, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emil. That Thank was you. really exciting to listen to. I guess for all the people, for all the guests too. So they were so so um, so um, yeah amazed uh, maybe that uh, they have uh, postponed their questions. But if there are any, I guess it was a quite complex topic. There no, must no, be no, 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 <laughs> no. No, it was so easy. He demonstrated it was so easy. So no questions at all, I guess. <laughs> so here's the first one. So actually, it's two questions. The first is about the uh, complexity for uh, the Clarion language. So I just wonder, uh, for example, uh, finding an uh, isolated subgroup uh, within the graph. So uh, I, I guess you have, um, in, in your query language, you have some basics for this. So this might be some of these uh, common queries I would fire against the graph database. So. Is it an easy one? Really, it's just F finding an isolated sub subgroup unconnected to the uh, 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 other component. I connected like to itself, but not <laughs> to someone yeah, else. A, a click. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, 
there are no, there's no built-in support for that. You can describe it using Cypher's pattern language. But here's actually one of the one of the areas where where graph databases are today is that graph databases are really really good for what we call graph local operations. So if you like, most of the queries that I've shown you today have been queries where you start with an individual and then you graph from there, right? Whereas graph global operations, let's say that you want to look inside your entire big data set and you want to um, uh, do centrality of the entire graph, right? So what then the graph database will do is it's going to have to look inside of every each and every one of the, the nodes of the ent entire graph, and at that point performance will not be great. And this may be, it actually depends on how you implement it, but this may very well be one of those. Okay. Uh, that's exactly what I expected. Yeah. So on the on the other hand, the uh, complexity uh, here of the uh, querying the data itself. So uh, the key word of this is uh, TSP. So if I want to, to uh, save Christmas and uh, <laughs> uh, just want to have the shortest route, it's also a uh, graph algorithm or graph, a graph query. So uh, support for this built in and how fast? <laughs> uh, did you say DSP? DSP, like uh, transaction problem. Shortest route about all the cities in a cycle. Short so oh, a traveling <laughs> salesman. Oh, okay, so, okay, sorry, traveling salesman. Yeah, you can, you can express, so, so this is also comes into one of the limitations of Cypher, right? So Cypher today can do pattern matching really well and it can do some amount of iterative algorithms, but most of them are built in, right? So when I say iterative algorithm, it's something like page rank, right? Where you, you take another step, and then you think a little bit, and you take another step, and you think a little bit, and you take another step, right? That's an iterative algorithm, uh, which today is basically difficult to, to uh, express using Cypher. So this has been the 101 class, right? So all of my examples have been in Cypher. And Cypher is a very living language. We're, we're evolving it every day. I mean, it's always backwards compatible, but we're adding new things to it every day, right? Uh, but there's a bunch of aspects where you can't express it in Cypher, and this is one of them. Um, and the recommended path then is you go to the what's called the unmanaged extension API. So there's a way of writing imperative code using Java that you drop into the server, and it runs on, on the server, which is very close to the metal, and you have a complete Turing, I mean, you have a Turing complete language, right? So you can express anything. Um, Cypher really tries to make a bunch of things succinct and easy to use, but it can't yet do everything. It's not, it's not Turing complete. I'm not sure if it ever will be Turing complete, but one of the things that we will add though is some amount of UDFs or stored procedures, so user-defined functions. Currently you can say, like, like remember how we said match Anne loves whom, or something like that, right? Um, you can today say Anne shortest path whom, right? And you, you and you can get that shortest path, right? But there's no way for you to write that function yourself. You just have to deal with the ones that that we that we deliver to you, which are not a whole lot actually. There's only a few of them. Um, and o obviously, in the future, we want we want you to be able users to be able to define those functions so that they can run in Cipher. And there's very likely to also be some kind of stored procedure wrapper around it. And the way that I think about it, although uh, that may very well change, but the, the way I think about that is some kind of like um, JavaScript compatible or JavaScript-like language, but much more simplified probably, with Cypher as, as first-class uh, citizen, right? So you can wrap Cypher in that. And at that point, from an expressiveness perspective, we will be there with Cypher. Then we can do everything, like what, whatever, whatever type of algorithm you want to do. You can, you can do it. Then, of course, is the performance going to be there? That's always the question of which algorithm and how you implement it and all those things. Okay, thanks a lot. Sure. Next Good one, questions. please. <laughs> if I'm right, you have uh, also in-memory implementation of Neo4j. Can you please give us some real-world use cases, I mean, with large scale operations using this component? No. No. Okay. I can, however, give you real world uses of it, and it's very simple. It's two words unit testing. Done. It's basically used for that. And what we say when you, if you are in production 
and you need to be in memory for some reason, and there are, I think, lots of good reasons for that, um, then what we say is you should still use normal Neo4j, but just give it a lot of heap size. Then Neo4j, it's a database, so after a while it's going to realize, hey, you know, I might as well keep all of this in memory. Um, and you can even do, I mean, we have some customers that have like warm up things. Basically, they go in and they touch all the nodes and make sure that they get into the caches. And then after that, it's all, all the read operations are in memory. And the write operations, of course, still write to disk, right? Uh, but so the, there's an impermanent graph database is what it's called. And, and it's basically used for, for unit testing only. Thanks. Sure. Okay, there are more questions. I guess one in the corner there. <laughs> Hi, I just have two, uh, two questions. One question is, are you thinking of making Cypher a standard so we can use it with another graph that is? And another question is, what do you think um, things like Titan versus Neo4j? Well, two easy questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first one I don't think so, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, Cypher standardization. So this is what I believe. If if there's a standardized query languages, uh, standardized query language graph databases today, we're going to fail. We as an industry, like graph databases, will be gone because innovation will completely stagnate and it's going to be run through a committee which has, in my mind, very seldomly produced good stuff. If we standardize Cypher today, we're gone. We're, we're, we're doomed. If in five years there's not a standardized way of accessing graph databases, we will have failed. Like the, It will never get into the mainstream. People will be afraid of vendor lock-in. And I can talk however much I want about the how you avoid vendor lock-in. It's not through a standardized query language. It's actually through architecture. But that's a completely thing that no one, like maybe some people will agree with, but it doesn't matter. Uh, we need a standardized query language in order to get adopted by the mainstream. Now, when between now that we're dead if we do it, or five years we're dead if we don't do it, is the right time? I don't know. You tell me. Yeah, I mean, I think that I mean that, that's that's the art of of this, right? Um, and I mean, it's it's interesting to see like there's there's a bunch of other like the document space, right? Clearly, much much bigger than uh, than the graph space in terms of adoption, right? And they don't have a standardized query language, right? So you can obviously get to get to some point. Now, a lot of people would argue that relational database would never have happened um, if SQL hadn't been standardized. Other people will argue that SQL was never standardized. <laughs> so, I mean, it's 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 a difficult one. I spent a lot of time thinking about it. A lot of time thinking about it. Like, what I do know, I mean, I, people have always been asking for us to standardize whatever API we're on, because so far we've always been the the biggest graph database in terms of adoption, um, and not necessarily because we're the best graph database, but I think because we're the earliest, and we also have a really good looking CEO. Inside voice, inside voice. Um, th so people have always been asking us to do that. And if we had done it when they first asked us, we all in the space would have used like an API that I randomly drew on a napkin 14 years ago, right? And then we realized, Cypher, holy shit, this is 10 times better, 10 times more productivity using Cypher. Um, and I'm not sure that we're not gonna make that leap again. I think it's a very early space. We're learning so much. I know 100 times more today than I did 18 months ago. Uh, is the same thing going to be true 18 months from now? Maybe. Another 18 months? Maybe not. I mean, there's, there's an asymptotic cutoff to the point where you m get more data, but you don't glean more insight, right? I think the first th thousand deployments that we got learned, taught us a whole lot. Uh, but when we're now past that point. We're at 10,000 deployments of Neo for day, right? Or something like that. It's open source, you don't really know, but something like that. Um, so anyways, that was, I can, do you want, I can talk more about this topic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but so that was the first question. What's the other question that I didn't want to answer? Oh, Titan. Titan. That's right, yeah, that's the other question. Yeah, that's usually the question that I want to answer. So Titan, for those of you, how many here knows Titan? Okay, not a whole lot of people. So Titan is basically, uh, uh, People describe it as a graph database. It's a distributed graph database is how it's being described. I disagree with that, uh, but I'm also like a competitor, right? So you should take everything I say with a very big grain of salt, right? Uh, but it's basically um, 
a, an approach to write a distributed graph database that can do sharding automatically, right? And so what is sharding? How many knows what sharding is? Okay, most people. So basically a way of automat automatically chopping up a data set, right, uh, in, into a database. And the sort of classic, the most simple example of sharding is if you set aside graphs. For now, if you have, let's say, a document database and you want to store you a bunch of users, right, and you don't want to put all of them in the same database system, then let's imagine that you did something as simple as all users are start with A, put it in one machine. All users starting with B, put it in the second machine. All users starting with C, put it in the third machine, right? So that's a very simple sharding scheme. And it doesn't work, actually. But <laughs> I mean, it kind of conceptually works, but it's a very stupid one, right? Uh, but conceptually, uh, th that's what sharding does, which is awesome, because it allows you to chop up your graph, and it's very, it's chop up your data set. And it's very simple to go in and find those A users. But what if you wanted to do a calculate average age of your entire thing? So, Uh-oh, then you have to there and then you have to hop over there and then you have to hop over there and then basically re-implementing sort of a, a database on top of your databases is kind of awkward uh, but it kind of works and you do it because you're hipster compliant and data sets are big and you have right throughput and you think that you're going to be the next Google bless you right we think we're going to be the next Oracle right so I, I have I have empathy for that uh, but nicer 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 <laughs> I promise it will be nicer um, but with a graph though Right? With a graph, the challenge is that you want to chop up your data set according to where there's no connections, right? Because those A people weren't connected to B people, weren't connected to C people. But in a graph, everything is connected to everything, potentially. So how do you chop that up, right? That's kind of difficult to do. Unless you maybe you freeze the world and you say, I'm now going to analyze my data set, stop the world, nothing is writing right now. And then you see, hey, there's a little click over here and there's a partition over here. And then it's like, you put it down and it's like, you're done. And then the world stops and it starts working again and then some dude from Brazil becomes friend with a guy from Europe. It's like, no, because I was shorting based on continents or something like that, right? And then the entire thing falls over, right? Um, so that's an unsolved problem in, in the graph database world, according to me. Now, Titan, that, uh, that uh, the question was about, claims to have solved it by implementing a graph layer on top of Cassandra, right? So Cassandra is the distributed uh, database system which implements a number of, of am amazing features and it's automatically sh sharded using consistent hashing. If that means something to you, it's, it automatically shards basically. And of course, my argument then, and here comes to my, to my, my real uh, assessment of, of Titan. And again, I'm a competitor talking about a competitor now, right? But the way that I, we could easily have done that years and years ago, right? I'm a really good friend of Jonathan Ellis, the founder of, of Cassandra and, and Datastax, at least the founder of Datastax. And we could have easily have done that a long time ago, except it doesn't work. Because what it does is that it then just takes a completely arbitrary sharding key and it starts shard on something like that, which is not going to be along the shape of the graph, at which point, what have you gained? If that was, if it was that easy, I could have, have easily have implemented a distributed graph database using 10 lines of Perl. It would just be a front end to S3 and would take all the first 10 nodes I would put in one S3 bucket and the next 10 nodes I would put in the second S3 bucket and the third I would put in the third S3 bucket and it would be super fast. You could add data really fast, which is one of the things that a lot of people claim that, uh, that you can do with the distributed graph database like Titan and others. You can add data really fast but like all the operations that matter to me in a graph database are around reading data along the relationships, right? And at that point, you need to jump from that bucket to that bucket and to that bucket to that bucket and it becomes really slow, right? So, so that's why we haven't embarked on that architecture ourselves. Now, the Titan crew, like the, the, the gang who implemented Titan, uh, who are implementing Titan, is with a, uh, a group called Aurelius, uh, who are actually a really good friend of ours. And we co-founded a project called Tinkerpop, which at least you know of. How many here have heard of Tinkerpop or Gremlin? Yeah, a few people. Which is um, uh, another way of accessing uh, graph databases. And, and we actually co-founded that uh, with, with uh, the Aurelius crew. So really good friends of them, and they're some of the smartest people around. So really, really good guys. And from that perspective, since my goal is to grow the graph database space, which is why I don't want to standardize right now, my goal is to, to grow the graph database space. It's good to have the various people trying different approaches. 
But that's why we haven't chosen that approach. Two <laughs> long answers to two <laughs> questions that I didn't want to answer. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Maybe some more quick questions because we have, <laughs> <all> <laughs> <laughs> we okay. have also I can also answer uh, faster. We, we have yeah. some snacks <laughs> for you and the drinks <laughs> are waiting also. <laughs> so yeah, just shoot. Hi, um, really small questions. Uh, first of all, how does the um, search by ID works in Neo4j? Mm. The next question is, for instance, a company realizes that they might use the Neo4j for some specific task. And um, does it mean that, and they already have some, you know, huge database for main operations or something. Does it mean that they have to, like, load the existing data into the Neo4j and have the duplicate data? Or what are they going to do? And the super small question, do you support <laughs> the uh, weighted graphs so to calculate the cheapest paths? I'll take the I'll, I'll take them I'll take the super small one first. So weighted graph, yes, by adding I didn't mention that I should have, but you can in the same way that you can add properties, key value pairs to the nodes, you can also do that to the relationships. So the relationships are first class citizens in the graph model. Uh, so you can just add data to them, which means that you can add weight or, or something like that. Did that answer your question? No. Yeah, 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 but that was just a super, that was just, I asked the, I answered the super small question. Yeah, yeah, the third question. Y y y then it's up to you to, like, what, that's how you store the data, and then it's up to you to use that data in, in your algorithms. Okay, we can talk more. Uh, we can talk more about it offline. I, I can show you how, how it works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The answer is yes. <laughs> um, and and the first one is on the IDs. Uh, the the short version is don't <laughs> don't use IDs. So we ha actually have a legacy type of IDs. Like when you create the node, it's going to get an internal ID, which we end up we which we in the first API that I uh, specified we exposed out to the end user get node by ID, right, in the Java API, uh, which was a mistake. We shouldn't have done that. Um, and in the Cypher world, we're asking people to move away from that. And we're actually going to implement a couple of convenient off-ramps from that. If, you, if you're if used to using the IDs, um, ways of getting away from that. But that Im involves building some ID generators and, and, and stuff like that. But the, the short of it is the internal IDs shouldn't be used by, by anyone. That still didn't answer your question, I see. So we'll take also that one offline. <laughs> and and uh, the second question, uh, which if uh, I'll repeat it, was basically if you already have big data sets up and running uh, and, and, and in use in your company and you want to use Neo4j for a specific use case, how does that work? Are you going to have to duplicate the data? And unfortunately, the answer is yes. Uh, and we, we do have a lot of people doing that where they have big relational database system up and running and then polyglot persistence and all those good things right where you say that hey parts of this data set is actually graphy so i'm going to take that and i'm going to put it in neo4j um and that's that's the right way of doing it so the graphy data lives here and the tabular data lives here but people never move into that immediately the first thing is because they don't trust us immediately why would they right it's a database so then they replicate the graphy data from their whatever installation uh from their oracle let's say and replicate that into Neo4j. And then you have the, you're violating the dry principle, don't repeat yourself, right? And it's it's messy and it's data duplication. It, we, even though there are many database models that have made that their entire thing to duplicate data, I actually don't like duplicating data. Uh, but it's a transitionary phase that, that a lot of people do. And it's it's messy, but but doable. Okay, last and, question. And let's make sure we, we get to your other questions then afterwards. Last question, maybe, yeah, and maybe you can answer some more in uh, yes. face to face yes. uh, later on. Okay, could you please uh, pass over the microphone? No, please use it because uh, it's easier to. Uh, so I was wondering, after looking at this traveling, uh, the tr the routing problem, um, how does this all work with dynamic data? If the the edges between the nodes are changing their values rapidly and then do you need a snapshot of the system to actually compute your algorithms or how does this actually work? I mean, there I see like problems 
coming up. Yeah, are you talking about sort of concurrency problems, or are you talking fr from what perspective? Um, yeah, basically in a big data world, you have a continuous stream on data coming in. Yeah. So um, can you, how, how, how does the system handle that? You know, I mean, basically the, the data is changing all the time. You need a, s a limited amount of time to compute your algorithm. In that time, some of the values might have changed already. Mm. Uh, mm. You, as I said, uh, you need a snapshot in order to move yeah. forward. Or yeah, great question, right? So basically there are two broad ways you can work with Neo4j. Um, one is the Cypher stuff that I've showed you today. And the other one is, I, and I mentioned it to uh, in, uh, in, in the previous question is the unmanaged extensions, which are Java code that you deploy on onto the server. Um, in Cypher land, you have a couple of default isolation levels and you don't have a lot of control over that yet. This is something that we will implement. Uh, we have currently, we support an internal version of MVCC, model version concurrency control. No, multi version concurrency control. Um, and um, we, so that we use internally, uh, but that's not exposed out through Cypherland. If you have one of those situations where like, we have data changing so rapidly and we run an algorithm and we, we're calculating something, but it's then changing behind our backs, right? As you know, a, a after we have calculated it, then the end result is really important that it's valid. Then you do need to drop down to the unmanaged extension level. And there you have amazingly fine grained control. You can grab individual locks over here. And we're really good about like how the locking works in terms of you can have multiple reads and multiple writes at the same time. There's no global write lock at all, uh, not even on a node level. That goes um, along the lines of having a verification step after you compute a result. No, locking, pessimistic locking. Locking. Right. So, and, and then, but you could also do verification, of course. Uh, but, but you could like, okay, these are the actual contention points. Let's, let's lock exactly that node and exactly that node over here. Stuff like that, right? Uh, so that's the way you would do that today. Tomorrow, for some definition of tomorrow, uh, you're going to be able to declare that in, 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 in Cypher. And there's the obvious challenge of like the more MVCC you are, like the slower it is, and like all of those things, right? Uh, but that at least we're going to give you the ability to do that trade-off from Cipher.